Good morning, brothers and sisters. Welcome to this new week of study. As we return to our studies in the book of Daniel, shall we seek our Heavenly Father's guidance and ask for his blessing as we open his word and look to understand that which is written for this time. Shall we now pray? Gracious Father in heaven, thank you for these blessings that you have been providing. Help us now, Father, as we open your word to understand that which you would have us to understand. I thank you for those that are taking time to be involved in this meeting today. I ask a blessing upon them. We ask, Father, for your guidance and your direction so that we may more clearly understand your word of truth. Help us now so that we may seek you in spirit and in truth. So that we may be directed and guided to give the message that you would have us to give at this time in earth's history. Be with us now, for we invite you into this meeting. Help our hearts <clears throat> to be prepared for that which you would have us to know. For this we thank you, for this we praise you, in Jesus' name, amen. Now, as we return to this portion of the book of Daniel. We were having quite an interesting conversation this last week on these different points. <laughs> now, we had been addressing verse 14. Quickly, we will, we will again touch on verse 15. So the king of the north shall come and cast up a mount and take the most fenced cities and the arms of the south shall not withstand, neither his chosen people, neither shall there be any strength to withstand. As Smith wrote, the tuition of the young king of Egypt was entrusted by the Roman Senate <clears throat> to M. Emilius Lepidus who appointed Aristomenes, an old and experienced minister of that court, as his guardian. His first act was to provide against the threatened invasion of the two confederate kings, Philip and Antiochus. To this end, he dispatched Scopus, a famous general of Aetolia, then in the service of the Egyptians, into his native country to raise reinforcements for the army. Having equipped an army, he marched into Palestine and Coel, Syria, Antiochus being engaged in a war with Attalus in Lesser Asia, and reduced all of Judea into subjection to the authority of Egypt. So here, the Romans were employing a Greek general for service to the Greek king of the Egyptians. Thus, affairs were brought into a posture for the fulfillment of the verse before us. For Antiochus, desiring from his war with Attalus at the diction of the Romans, took speedy steps for the recovery of Palestine and cold Syria from the hands of the Egyptians. Scopus was sent to oppose him. Near the sources of the Jordan, the two armies met. Scopus was defeated, pursued to Sidon, and there closely besieged. Three of the ablest generals of Egypt, with their best forces, were sent to raise the siege, but without success. At length, Scopus, meeting in the gaunt and intangible specter of famine, a foe with whom he was unable to cope, was forced to surrender on the dishonorable terms of life only, whereupon he and his 10,000 men were suffered to depart stripped and naked. Here was the taking of the most fenced cities by the king of the north, 
for Sidon was, both in its situation and its defenses, one of the strongest cities of those times. Here was the failure of the arms of the South to withstand, and the failure also of the people with which the King of the South had chosen, namely Scopus and his Ayatollah forces. Now, do we have any comments on this portion at this time? Well, I'm trying to wrap my mind around this again. So, um, so, so we know that this is going to be uh, events that are connected with what happens in the aftermath of Paneum. We know that, that Egypt is is being supported by uh, Rome in verse 14. Right. So, so this is just the aftermath of what, what happens with, with Egypt. So Egypt is going to be uh, supported by Rome so that the king of the north doesn't dominate. And then you're going to have, have Rome stand um, in 11 verse 16, the next verse, right? He did come right. again to do as according to his own will and not just stand before him. Um, hmm. I, I just don't remember what particularly there was about this. Um, for some reason, my brain is, isn't uh, pulling this together. So the most fenced cities, we know that was like Sidon, and, uh, right? So, okay. So the people of his choice. So that was one thing that we did differently. And so what we had is um, in our uh, present truth application as well. So, so what? here's what I have. So the king of the north, that's Antiochus the third, the USA, is how we're going to apply it present truth. And I know we're not usually looking at the present truth here. Right. But we're saying that this is circa 200 BC. So this is the Battle of Paneum in that in that time. Then so we align that with November 9th, 1989. <laughs> um and cast up a mount, so there's this siege, and we're taking that as representing the economic pressure that happened uh, prior to 1989, right? So that was occurring, that's what led to the downfall of the Soviet Union. And take the most fenced cities, so Judea, of Judea and Sidon being one of those, that this is the apostate Protestant churches are conquered at 1989. And the arms of the South. So here this is representing the Soviet Union in our history, right, 1989. And Egyptian army under Ptolemy V, that's atheistic communism in the present truth, shall not withstand uh, or stand up is the idea. That is, they're going to lose the Battle of Paneum, November 9th, 1989. Neither his chosen people, that is, the choicest people, that is, the global elites. Neither shall there be any strength to withstand. So. The reason why I mentioned the present truth one here is that we are taking the Battle of Paneum and we say that it's typical of something. What it's typical of is 1989, as the Battle of Raffi is typical of 1798, right? That's how we, we understood this. Okay. Okay. Um, so... I, you know, what he's saying in his present truth um, or in his historic application. I'm looking over this again. So, so he has the king of the south, the, uh, the failure which the king of the south had chosen. Right. So I think there's a difference here in who his is referred to. I think that's mainly the difference. So the king of the north shall come against him, cast up a mount, shall take the most fenced cities, and the arms of the south shall not withstand. 
neither his chosen people, he's going to have. Uh, so, so we're taking that as the elites. Okay, so that would be. So, who are the chosen? The chosen people are the people of his choice. In the present truth application, we're saying that it's the elites, but the elites, they exist as part of the king of the south. So that would be the same. So I right. think his interpretation's okay. That from, I thought we had some some other point, but it's probably that I'm thinking this out loud, but it might help other people um, sort through this. So so what is the the role of Scopus in this? So that's where I'm headed. Okay, so here's Scopus, mm -hmm. a Greek who is sent to defend the armies of Egypt or to lead the armies of Egypt. He goes in to a battle wins the first in 217, but loses the second in 200. So <clears throat> we were addressing that 217 was a symbol of midnight. Yeah. Now is 200 a symbol of the midnight cry or does 191 become the symbol of the midnight cry? Hmm. Well, well, we don't know exactly which year the Battle of Pinium occurred, but we do know it's around 200. Correct. One those ones they don't have a, an exact date. Okay. Oh, well, let's. Well, I don't. I don't. I don't know. <clears throat> I don't think we're going to take 200 as a symbol of the midnight cry. Okay, now Scopus, of course, is he's an Aetolian general, but right. he is he's being brought about because of Rome, right? Correct. So, so we have Rome here involved in the Battle of Pinium. Um, now Rome is representing. Uh, in 1989, representing the papacy? Is that how it is? I would think so. Okay. I think that's how we, we would look at it. So we got Rome. Um, so, so how do we look at this? So how does he get Scopus in there? Like, what is he... Because in our uh, historic application that we have, we don't mention Scopus by name in this. <clears throat> so what what is the key that he has for bringing in Scopus? Is that representing the global elites? That doesn't make sense. The choicest people? That doesn't make sense. Because hmm. he's taking this just as part of the history but he's not taking it from a specific part of this verse. He's, he's going back to verse 14, right? I would say so. Okay. So in verse 14, that the robbers of thy people, um, Rome spoke. So I'm just looking back at verse 14. That's where he says, Rome spoke. And Syria and Macedonia soon found a change coming over the aspect of their dream. The Romans interfered on behalf of the young king of Egypt. So, so this is 200 BC. So he's going back to that verse, and it's so it, he's, Scopus is not mentioned by name, but it must be uh, from verse 14. Okay. Um. But he doesn't mention in his commentary on verse 14, he doesn't mention Scopus. He was going to mention it in verse 15. I don't know. Any thoughts on that? I mean, Scopus is not, he's not mentioned by name. 
in Daniel 11. But it is the result of the robbers of other people exalting themselves to establish the vision. I don't know. Many thoughts on that. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> um, I'm looking to see if I can find where Smith could have addressed Scopus as as being part of of this situation. Yeah, he just he just basically says because of this threatened invasion, you're going to have Scopus, a fam famous general of Anatolia, then in the service of the Egyptians into his native country. So he he dispatched Scopus into his native country to raise reinforcements for the army. But after equipping an army, he marched into Palestine and Kul Syria, Antiochus being engaged in a war with Attalus and Lesser Asia and reduced all Judea to the authority of Egypt. Right. So. Says, what Thus the affairs were brought about for the fulfillment of the verse before us. So he's yeah. saying that all that has to be set in place for this battle of Benin. It seems to me that, you know, I mean, if I was looking at this verse by itself, um, I, I wouldn't see Scopus. But so it's something that Uriah Smith is introducing. And, and, and it could be true. I, I, you know, I would need to look at this here, history in a bit more detail. So, because when we dealt with this in not looking at Uriah Smith, we never dealt with Scopus at all, right? So, whether Scopus is really the important issue here or not, we know that Rome is here, right? Because they're 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 supporting them, but the question is exactly how. He's just saying it's. It's Scopus, but that's he's not directly saying that that is Rome, right? So he's not giving us hmm, he's not giving us enough information of why he has drawn that conclusion. Just it's from history. So we know they're not going to withstand that Egypt's going to lose the Battle of Nian. And so he's just giving us the historical background of that. I'm not really sure you know, what we should do, whether we should like move to the next verse or we have any more comments on this. I was trying to look up how yep. Smith would have come up with source material on this. Some of these things Polybius would have had that, and that would have been something that, that Smith would have made use of. Yeah, I was, was going to ask, are there other, what do the other commentators say? They get Scopus somewhere. Well, I they're going to have, they're going to, uh, most of them are going to have a tie, uh, Antiochus Epiphanes involved here. So, um, is Scopus mentioned in other commentaries then, though? That's my question, I guess. Not that I know of. Okay, Scopus is mentioned fairly extensively <clears throat> in a book that's in the public domain, Dictionary of Greek and Roman Biography and Mythology, that was published in 1870, which is the time in which this article was published, by a William Smith. So, I... I would have my problems with a lot of the other commentators because I don't see the involvement of Epiphanes in this at all, but I do see Antiochus the Great. Yeah. Um, so Albert Barnes, he does, um, he's similar to uh, Uriah Smith's position. So, um, so here is what Albert Barnes says. So, neither is chosen people. He's going to say the people of his choices, those whom he had selected or chosen to carry on the war, 
referring perhaps to the fact that he would deem it necessary to employ picked men or to send the choicest of his forces in order to withstand Antiochus. So Antiochus the Great, that is Tychus the Third, right? Such occurrence is in every way possible to illustrate this. It is only necessary to say that the Egyptians sent three of their most distinguished generals with a select army to deliver Sida, Europus, Menocles, and Demonexius, Demoxenus. And then he so then neither shall there be any strength to stand, no forces which the Egyptians can employ. In other words, Antiochus would carry all before him. This is in strict accordance with the history when Scopus was defeated by Antiochus at Peneus, that is Peneum, right. near the sources of the Jordan. He fled and entrenched himself in Sida. There was there he was followed and besieged by Antiochus. The king of Egypt sent the three generals above named with a choice army to endeavor to deliver Scopus, but they were unable. Scopus was obliged to surrender in consequence of famine, and the choicest forces returned to Egypt. So if we're going to deal with, uh, yeah, so this this makes sense, actually. I mean, just the, the background history of what's happened, why Scopus is mentioned, because he's going to be uh, involved in this battle of Pinea. Historically. So the question is, where is he mentioned in this verse, verse 15? Is Scopus one of the chosen people? Yeah, that's what I'm wondering. So, And so his cho chosen people, is that the chosen people of the king of the south, or is that the chosen people of the king of the north? Right. Um, you would almost think chosen people of the king of the south. Yeah, because when it says neither his chosen people, they're um, the way that they're putting the neither in there is it's in the next part. So neither his chosen people. And then it says neither shall there be any strength to withstand. Well, the neither is only in the last phrase. It's not in the they shall not withstand the people of his choice. So that would be the kings of. So they're, they're so they're saying his, neither shall he withstand. The people of his choice shall not withstand. Right. That is neither shall there be any strength to withstand. Um, so I'm trying to look at the Hebrew here. Just uh, I know we kind of had sorted this out before, but. I don't think completely. And um, so, okay, I see. So, yeah, so that's the kings. That's the choicest ones are the king of the south. So that's, mm -hmm. so that means that the king of the south, if, if this, if we're going to apply this to 1989 and we have that there are choicest people, that's the elites, right? That's how we applied it. But we're saying that that Scopus is someone who comes from Rome. So Rome is, in, in this con context, it's neither the king of the south or the king of the north, correct? Right. Now, in 1989, well, the king of the north is the United States with the papacy. Could we say that the papacy um, is also connected to the Soviet Union? That there is, because we, we, we always say, well, the, the papacy is trying to overthrow the Soviet Union, right? That's Correct. what the papacy is doing. But is there some way in that the papacy is still behind things in the Soviet Union? That there is... Uh, that there is a purpose there. What about what about um, Mikhail Gorbachev? Now he's going to be the one who who brings the Soviet Union to an end. Is there any way that he's connected to 
to Scopus. Because in 1999, if we, we equate this to the Battle of Dunia, uh what kind of battle is it? What it, it's this economic and military pressure is brought against the Soviet Union and the Soviet Union. It ends right. There isn't like there isn't a battle per se in the way that we would normally think of it. We don't have a, a full out war against the United States and the Soviet Union, or would we say that Scopus represents? I don't know. It, it would have to be something connected with the Soviet Union, but we're saying it's, it, you know, if we're par- paralleling it to 1989, could we say that in some way that the papacy has a connection within the Soviet Union that causes this to happen? Or would we have Scopus as being uh, something to do with, um, um, Lequalenza. Or would that that make more sense? That might make more sense. But why why Lequalenza? Oh, it's just because I'm looking at a force that's connected to the papacy that's bringing down the Soviet Union, but not directly connected. So, are you now, looking at, at Walensa because of his his leadership in the Solidarity Movement and his connection with John Paul II? Yeah, but you know, Scopus is supposed to be the general supporting them, the Soviet Union. I mean, you know, right? Do you understand what I'm saying? So, right. so let when let's it doesn't maybe make sense. We just we don't have him in our interpretation of that verse in the present truth application. We don't have Scopus being marked out, right? That's basically the problem that I'm struggling with. But we don't have Scopus mentioned directly in verse 15. We just have Rome. So the way that we did it here. Uh, So if we look look at verse 14, here's what we have in the present truth. And in those times, the Soviet-Afghan war of 3,341 days, there shall many, uh, Reagan and Pope John Paul II, stand up, that is, make war. And that war is going to be the solidarity movement. That's what we have. Against the king of the south, the Soviet Union. And the robbers um, of thy people, the breakers of thy people, right? Uh, we're connecting that to um, from 1863 to 1989, the 126 shekels of Daniel 5 are all mentioned in there, the Sheba the seven times, right? So we know that this is related to um, that 126 years from 1863 to 1989. That's what we're connecting. So the, okay. so the breakers of that people were making that application um, of thy people that is Rome, right? The papacy shall exalt themselves to uh, and that themselves to support the Polish trade unions to establish the vision, right? So that's what happens in 1989. So we have Pope John Paul. They're gonna they're going to make war through this solidarity movement against the Soviet Union, right? And so Rome exalts itself to establish the vision. Um, and, and in our history, that's going to be the papacy that exalts themselves to establish the vision. And and they do that through the support of the Polish trade union. So, so that would have to be like Walensa would be the one that connects with Scopus. And the, the chosen people, the peoples of thy choice later on, that's going to be this group that comes out of the Soviet Union. So when we have in verse 15, 
So the king of the north, which in this case is the United States. So we always say sort of, you know, the king of the north is the papacy in connection with the United States. But here it's it's basically representing what the United States does. On November 9th, 1989, through this economic and military pressure, uh, take the Protestant churches, right? The most fenced cities, the Protestant churches, the apostate Protestant churches. And the Soviet Union, that is atheistic communism, right? The king of the south shall not stand up. That is, it's not that they don't withstand. They don't stand up. Historically, Egypt does not um, become the next kingdom. They lose the Battle of Pania. So, so that's November 9th, 1989. Neither his, so we say uh, the Battle of Pania. The choicest people, the global elites, neither shall there be any strength to withstand or to stand up. So part of the, the, the idea that we had here is that um, historically we have these different kingdoms and these different kingdoms stand up, right? To do according to their will. But that doesn't happen with the king of the South. It doesn't, it, it's not the kingdom that's established. So we had, so if we go back and we look at Greek, Greece stands up, and that's going to be through the king doing according to his will. And that context is going to be um, Alexander the Great. Then his kingdom is divided, and all this, uh, these civil wars occur. But none of these kingdoms are the, one, are the next kingdom of Bible prophecy. The next kingdom of Bible prophecy is Rome, the one that exalts itself to establish the vision. Is that making sense? It, it is to me. Okay. And so then in our history, we have uh, the Soviet Union, right? There is this, uh, this, this battle that's going on between the king of the north and the king of the south, right? And then the United States. So there's this. Battle going, but we would we, what we would call in a sense the Cold War, right? It's it's going to be heightened. The papacy is going to come along and get involved in it, right? In the nineteen eighties, and then when the Soviet Union falls, there is an elite that comes out. So that means the Soviet Union falls, and it doesn't establish itself. You know, it doesn't it doesn't exalt itself to establish the vision. It's going to be the papacy that does. And and the United States doesn't become, you know, Rome. It's it's you know, it's going to be connected with Rome. But it's going to be Rome that is the power here historically. And in our history, that's going to be the papacy. Right. So in verse 16, when it says he, the papacy that come up against him. Uh, uh, that is, the papacy is going to come and conquer the United States. So it's going to come against Seleucid Syria. So next thing in verse 16 is we're going to have, he shall do according to his own will. And that's going to be 191 BC. So that one's going to line up with December 25th, 1991. So the battle of Paneum is going to line up with November 9th, 2019, but on December 25th, 1991, what we see is that in that battle between the King of the North and the King of the South, the papacy is the one that ends up exalting itself to establish the vision, right? It's going to be the one there. And so when the Soviet Union falls, none shall stand before uh, it says before him, right? And we put, well, that will subjugate Syria and become the next king of the north. Right. So we had there um, that that's going to be the new world order under George Bush, the first, 
9-11, becomes the next king of the north. That is, the he, pagan Rome, under Pompey the Great, that is, the papacy, shall stand in the glorious land. Um, and that's going to be 9-11. That's what we have. Uh, so that's when the global elites, the new world order, conquered the United States. So the United States is conquered. And what this would then imply is that this new world order is, is the result of Rome coming in to establish the vision. Rome is conquering the United States, or really the global elites are. And those are the ones, so the people of his choice would then have to be referring to the his, um, in my, neither, neither his chosen people. Th that would have to refer to these global elites. And those, but those are connected to Rome. Uh, does that make sense? How does that tie in or whatever relate to Trump? Uh, Resisting the global elite. Well, that's in this history. We're not. Or is, we don't have or is it a play? It. So, so what's going to happen later on yeah, yeah. is you're saying. Yeah. So what's going to happen yeah. later on is we have this king of the north and the king of the south established. That is, the king of the south is still. Um, we would say that the global elites, that is globalists are connected with the papacy, right? Mm -hmm. Even though they're a separate power, right? Because the papacy is, is um, you know, we got the city of Babylon, the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. All of these mm -hmm. are part of Babylon. And we know that Babylon itself is, is, you know, mystery, Babylon, great, the mother of harlots, right? So we know that that's Babylon, but mm -hmm. it has three aspects of it. That so that is that this mystery called this, this Babylon the papacy is behind all of these three aspects of Babylon, right? Both the United States yeah. and mm -hmm. spiritualism. But there is a battle that goes on in order for that to that that threefold union to finally take shape, and that's going to be under the Sunday Law, right? So we have, in a sense, the United States is conquered by the papacy in 1989, and then at 911, the United States is conquered by the globalists. That is, the United States is joining hands with this papacy? power. Okay. How does the papacy conquer the U.S. in '89? Well, it it okay. We can say the United States reaches its hands across the Gulf to join hands with the Roman power, and in doing so, it's an alliance with the papacy. And nine eleven. What year was it? The what, was it Reagan or who? No, no, no. Anyway, who was it that the first president or the president to reappoint? Uh, political ambassador to the Vatican that happened in 19 something. I actually have the 19... article from the newspaper when that happened. It, it, that's Reagan. Reagan, yeah. Yeah. What, I kind of think of that as you know, joining yes. the papacy. Yeah. So that, that's happening behind the scenes, right? In that period, uh, what we call, um, how do we, so, uh, so Reagan and Pope John Paul stand up, right? That's in verse 14. In those, time, or, or those times, there shall be many, uh, Philip V, King of Macedon, and Antiochus III. And we, we put those to Reagan and Pope John Paul II, stand up. That is, they make war. And that's going to be the solidarity movement against the King of the South. That is the Soviet Union, and that robbers of thy people, right, right uh, exalt themselves to establish the vision. Right. So we're saying that that is referring to that history prior to 1989. 
wonder if the detail of how the papacy supported the uh, Union in Poland is, I don't know if it fits anywhere. The, 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 you see, how did they do it? They, they had the priests going back and forth with suitcases of American dollars. That's one of the ways that they founded yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Solidarity Movement. Right. So that's something within the Soviet Union itself, right? We're saying that that would represent Scopus. So it's oh, so okay. the way that the papacy was involved in the fall of the Soviet Union was behind the scenes in that way, right? Something within... Um, now, we look at Scopus as being this general of Egypt, and he's going to lose the Battle of Aenea. So the question is, well, is that is is this Scopus general symbolic of of Wick, Lech Walensa, or is it Gorbachev himself? Right, that's that's the question. I don't know. Do I? Do you have any? Anybody have thoughts on this? I'm is looking. At, right? I'm looking at a couple of different things. Okay. It's just that Scopus isn't himself mentioned here. Right. We just have Rome exalting itself to establish the vision. And the way that we put this in the present truth application in 1989, in that history, prior to 1989, is the papacy supports the Polish trade union. That, that's what we have. So they're going to make this war. So that war is going to be, you know, all of the things that are happening. Part of that is the solidarity movement. Was the support coming from the U.S. and the papacy, right? Uh, for the yes, the solid, for the solidarity trade movement. movement. Yeah, but it's it's really I, Rome. Yeah, behind. We, um, that, that, so if you look at it this way, mm -hmm. uh, the, the United States, it's going to use the economic and military pressure against the United States or against the USSR, right? That's the part that the United I was States going to ask the money, yeah, the money. But yeah, but it's going to be through the papacy itself and the support with the Polish trade union. The that is, is going the vehicle. To... Well, it's the vehicle. Well, that's the way in which Rome I mean, is involved, right? So the United States mm -hmm. is involved because they're military and economic pressure. Because there's this. this this um mm -hmm. so we have the, the king of mass philip yes so yeah so well not yes i guess you can say that that's the economic pressure right but you have or philip king of mastodon of. and antiochus the third so we said well that is going to be um you know pope john paul ii and reagan that's that's how mm -hmm. we put it in the present truth application we said that there's an say alliance that one more here. time we have Philip the Fifth, more time, King of Macedon, and Antiochus the mm Third. -hmm. That is when it says there shall many stand up against the King of the South, against Egypt, right? Ptolemy the Fourth. No, we're going to say Philip the, the Fifth, King of Macedon, and Antiochus the Third. They're going to become because we we see that Egypt. Um, could be overthrown by these powers. So Reagan and Pope John Paul II is what we have. And that may not be correct. That may not be the best way to look mm -hmm. at it. Okay. okay. But we know that, um, and we're Speaking saying that this is the Soviet-Afghan war. So maybe there's some other mm -hmm. way that we should look at this. Because mm -hmm. um, who does Philip V, King of Macedon, represent? So we, we kind of put, well, um, you know, that's going to be because because we have the United States. And the Soviet what Afghan does, war. Uh, is, in, what's that? In the spirit of prophecy, I, in the spirit of prophecy, I read recently, yesterday or the day before about the Macedonian cry. And it's in a positive way. Yeah, but that's a totally different. Yeah, I just wonder how she's using that or you're familiar with. I'm familiar with that. 
Yeah. Mm-hmm. But that, that has to do with uh, the story in, in Acts. Right. That's okay. it. Right. Re- so that's remind what, me of that story. I, I can't remember the details of it, but it has to do okay. with, uh, there's, a, there's a, some kind of call. Um, uh, let me see. I kind of, I, mean, I don't know my history that well, that well, but kind of related it to, uh, I th- I was thinking of the Spartans and the 300 or something, but that, that's not related or is it in the same area? Where is Macedonia again? Well, that's just the north, northern Greece. Okay. Is it Greece? Because it's a part of Greece or... Well, it's part of, part of Greece. I mean, Alexander oh. Alexander the Great was a Macedonian. So, so this oh. is Acts sixteen, like a province of Greece, a province yeah, so, of Greece yeah. kind of thing. Yes, yeah. Mm. Well, yeah, it's more complicated than that. But in it's it's in Acts six sixteen, and the vision appeared to Paul in the night. There stood a man of Macedonia and prayed, saying, "Come even over into Macedonia and help us." So that's the Macedonian cry. The call for help. Okay. Okay. Great. That's how she was using it for mission work. Yeah. Yeah. The Macedonian cry has gone forth. And... Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. So we wouldn't apply it here just because we have Philip, the king of maths at our. Um, but, you know, that's just an interpretation which we got from some other place. Um, I'm not sure exactly where. So we have, um, let me see, in those times, many shall stand up against the king of the south. So that what we had is that um, after the battle of Raphia, right, Egypt sort of weakens itself, right? It becomes weak. And the battle of Paneum is going to be when the the king of the north conquers the king of the south. But in that history, of, I, what? geographically, where were the battles of Panium and Ra- Raphia again? I well, the battle of Raphia. Heard it. Yeah. Mm. So the well, the battle of Panium, yeah, the, is in um, in Israel, right? That's going to be at uh, Caesarea Philippi. That's where when. When Jesus says uh, to Peter, uh, you know, thou art Peter, upon, but upon this rock I shall build mm-hmm. my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. That's where they are. They're at Paneum. Mm-hmm. And the gates of hell is a place in Paneum. Okay. Right. So so that's that's in northern Israel. Israel. Right. Okay. Israel. The Battle of Raphia is... Uh, I don't know its exact location, but it's uh, it's in Greece, right? Mm. I believe. Mm. What does the word raphia mean? And panium, panium. I think we connected to the word or p- pandemic or something. Uh, well, we, pan. yeah, it, it, yeah. It's just because of the pan. Is it right. the word, the entomology, is it, what they call it? Etymology. What's the word for words? Etymology. Etymology. Entomology is the study Etymology. of insects. Etymology. Insects, yeah. That I'm qualified in training. Yeah. Yeah, so. Uh, well, actually, Rafi is in Gaza. Okay. It's, so it is in Israel as well. It, it's a Palestinian city in the southern Gaza Strip. Yeah, I, I knew okay. that. I don't know why I forgot. Yeah, it's, it's early or late. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> I went to bed a bit late. Um, mm-hmm. And I woke up. So did I. Rick, and I. Rick and I talked till, till 2 a.m., 3 a.m. Yeah. his time. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so it's a place called Rafa. Okay, hmm. that makes sense. 
Interesting. I've not heard that. We need, I've never that ever put together for me before. Actually, I thought of the question. Okay. Yeah, I'm sure it has. It bears in somewhere. Okay, Dwight, you got anything yet? I've just been listening to what uh, what you both have been talking about on this. Okay. Um. The the direction that we we seem to be looking at them gives us points of reference into 2021. Now I'm in in considering some of what was being said. I agree that there was a time period where the United States had no official representation to the Vatican. It was in 1968 that Nixon appointed a personal representative to the Vatican. Yeah. Now, the person was the boy. Oh, go ahead. The, the a personal representative. Correct. And, and then, is there a difference between a personal representative and a political ambassador? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. As in. An ambassador has an official government standing. A personal representative does not. An ambassador has an embassy as well. Correct. Right. Now, and an, amb and an embassy is actually, you're given a part of your country is placed in that country. Right. Right. Yeah, yeah. Um. No, I believe that happened in 1987. Well, anyway, I'm I'm distracting from your point right there on the personal representatives. What year was that again? Okay, 68. That was 68. Oh. Now, the official diplomatic relations with the Vatican began under Reagan in 1984. So when, when Reagan first appointed a direct ambassador was again, 1984, when William Wilson was appointed as ambassador, then after him was Frank Shakespeare. Bush had one ambassador, Clinton had two, with a third that overlapped into the situation with George W. Bush. So you had one, two, three, four W. Bush, Barack Obama had one, two, and Trump has had one. Now, the official ambassador under Biden did not take his office until April 11th of 2022. So here we have 411 as a symbol, but I was more intrigued by the fact that April 11th, 2022, on the biblical calendar, would be the ninth day of the first month. You, you left out Obama. Did he have one? Uh, just a moment. The answer as far as this with Obama is yes, Obama actually, Obama had two ambassadors, but there was a time period where he could not get an ambassador approved. So they had a Shard d'Affaire for a year. 
and basically that's a diplomat that serves as the embassy's chief of mission in the absence of an ambassador. So Obama had one and Biden has had one because it took over a year before uh, Joe Donnelly was approved as ambassador under Biden. Question? Yes. So, so ambassadors have to be appointed uh, with each president? Correct. All ambassadors or just the, just the Vatican? All. Okay. Normally, an ambassadorial position is seen as being a um, a plum posting, something that the incoming president is doing to favor either a major contributor or someone that, that they view as a political ally. Mm -hmm. Congress... A lobby, almost, almost a lobby connection. Almost. Lobbying connection. Yeah. Congress has the ability to approve an ambassador, just like Congress has the ability to approve federal judges. If Congress does not agree with the party being appointed, they can decline to vote or allow for the appointment of that ambassador. And you will find that specifically uh, in 1951, because Harry Truman nominated Mark Clark, who was a World War II general and World War II hero, to be his emissary to the Vatican. Clark withdrew his nomination uh, about three months later because there were protests from U.S. Senator from Texas and different Protestant groups because they didn't want to see such a close relationship between the United States and Rome. How, how long was the, <clears throat> excuse me, how long was that post vacant U.S. Vatican ambassador? Uh, well, <clears throat> the first, the, there had, had been years where there had been a lot of communication and contact, diplomatic relationships between the U.S. and Rome. From 1797 to 1867, there had been diplomatic relationships but there had not been any kind of ambassador. Uh, that would be a 70-year period? That's a 70-year period, definitely. Yeah, and they have okay. this. So there's, there's the Papal States. Now, what are the Papal States? The Papal States were part of the area that was controlled and ruled directly by the Pope. Okay, and that's going to end in 1870, that Roughly, they cease yes. to exist. Correct. Well, it says here 1870. Right. Papal states cease to exist in 1870. So, so, so the United States has this diplomatic relation with the papal states from 1797, before the Pope is taken captive. Right. Uh, to 1867. But the papal states cease to exist in 1870. So, I mean, I don't understand that history fully. All I know is that uh, it lost its territory, it says here, to the city of Rome. Um, the last ter territory, the city of Rome was the last territory they had. And that was lost to the kingdom of Italy. Italy. So Italy took over the city of Rome. Correct. And so from that point on, uh, it says the international status of the papacy was controversial. Until 1929, when the Italian government agreed to the establishment of the Vatican City as a sovereign city state. So we're going to have from 1870 to Mussolini. 
Mussolini. Yeah, Mussolini okay. reappoint or did that, that was he? Was it? That was when that was when they was granted the state for the right. I believe, I believe that's correct. Uh not not state, but a sovereign nation, I think. The latter and like no, it's yeah, a sovereign city state. So city you nation. can see the progression. You can see yeah. the progression of the papacy as it moves, right? But is is it so that it's it's not a it's not in a state of Italy, but rather a country within Italy. Right. Yes, that's how I, that's how I understand it. Yeah, okay. Mm-hmm. And that was, I believe, Mussolini who brought that back under the Lateran Treaty. What that year you mentioned correct. there, Dwight? Yeah, the latter under okay. the Lateran Treaty. Yeah. Okay. So, so what we see is we see that there's this history in which the papacy, um, you know, ceases to exist as a city state. The papal state ceases to exist. Now we have, of course, February fifteenth, seventeen ninety eight, as the time of the end. Now it doesn't mean that the papacy ended, right? I mean, the papacy right. still continued, uh, but it's it's marking the time of the end because of. Uh, that 1260 years, there comes a point in which the United States rises up. That's going to be in 1798. And in connection with that, we have the Pope being taken captive, separate events, but they're, they're connected prophetically as the time of the end. And then we're going to have this progression of Rome coming back into power. First, it's going to lose a lot of its power, right? It's going to lose these city states. It's then going to, become a city state, the Vatican, 1929. And and then there's going to be this slow um, establishment of diplomatic relations with the United States. So the Holy See, as they call it here, um, says the United States was slow to establish full diplomatic relations with the reestablished Holy See. And partly due to the prevalence of anti-Catholicism in the United States, Right, so you got, uh, you know, uh, Franklin D. Roosevelt. He opposed uh, Postmaster General James Farley was the first highest-ranking government official to normalize relations with the Holy See in 1933. Right, so you have this progression of connections with the Vatican. Now it's so we're going to have the first ambassador under Nixon. Now. It says here, I have actually 1969 President uh, Richard Nixon changed this when he appointed as his personal representative, representative Henry Cabot Lodge Jr. Henry Cabot. As, oh, Cabot. Cabot. Canadian, we just say Cabot. <laughs> Understood. Uh, former U.S. Senator from Massachusetts. Nixon's 1960 Republican vice presidential running mate and a former U.S. ambassador to the United Nations. So, and then in 78, you're going to have Carter uh, has an ambassador uh, or, or a, a personal representative, pardon me, who was a former ambassador to Spain. So you're going to have these uh, personal representatives. Now, what's, what's an envoy? <clears throat> political envoy that, that... a status lower than an ambassador i believe okay so you some u.s presidents had personal envoys so that um howard william howard taft myron charles taylor and cabot jr with david walters and robert f wagner jr these were all um personal envoys, I guess, is what they're saying. Um, and then we have the ambassadors. So the first one is going to be William Wilson, 1984, under Ronald Reagan. Right? It, correct. It, it is interesting when you're looking like at the envoys. Mm-hmm. Because William Howard Taft, who was later a president of the United States, mm-hmm 
was appointed as envoy by Theodore Roosevelt. Yeah, 1902. Now, keep in mind that of all of the ambassadors that have been appointed to Rome, all of them have been Catholic. But we cannot say that of the envoys. I don't know that we could say that of the heads of the U.S. delegations at Rome either. Yeah. Now, so, I mean, and, and we're going to have um, Theodore Roosevelt doing this, um, this William Taft, right, being right. A, a personal envoy. But the Vatican doesn't actually exist as as a because that's prior to the latter treaty in 1929 correct so so the next one is going to be you know 1940 February right. 1940 Taylor um and and that's going to be under what that was Franklin Roosevelt that's Franklin Roosevelt but it's also Harry Truman oh okay yeah so yeah. Um, but that's after the Vatican has been established. So I'm wondering how you can have this personal envoy to the Vatican when there is no Vatican in 1902. So just well, probably to the Pope himself. They're just That's very possible. Yeah. Okay. I would think it would be an important relationship to try and maintain whether it has official status or not because they were the Vatican's power in the world. Like the U.S. would yeah. recognize that. Same thing as like perhaps keeping some sort of political communication open, say, between a country that's become, coming out of the Soviet Union. Yeah. Uh, but this is still official. And all of those. This is still yeah, an official thing. The other that's, presidents that's aren't going thing. to be having these personal envoys until 1940. Right. Oh. Just once. Yes. Okay. So that's during the time that the Vatican is no longer a papal state. So it's not until, and so in 1929, the Lateran Treaty occurs, but it's still going to be 11 years until you get the first personal envoy. But there is a personal envoy. Where was that? Time. Where was that 70 year period again, Dwight? You mean from 1797 to 1867? Yeah, yeah. I just, just want to mark that in my head. 1797. Okay. What, ain't that between World War One and World War Two? Just before World War Two? No, sir. It ain't. 1797 is one year before the time of the end, as we would view it. All right. 1867 is two years after the Civil War. Oh, I'm talking about the uh, World War One. That's 19, 1917, 1918, or if you're in Europe, 1914 to 1918. Well, 1929 is between the two wars, right? That 1929 is definitely between World War One and World War Two. Yes. That's what I, I'm just curious. Okay. No, it, it, it's quite interesting to see the the progression on these the lists of these ambassadors as well. Mm -hmm. So, so what we're saying here is we we go back to Daniel eleven verse eleven, right? The king of the south shall be moved with collar, shall come forth and fight with him, even with the king of the north, and he shall set forth a great multitude, but the multitude shall be given into his hand. That is, the king of the north sets forth the great multitude. But the multitude's given into the hand of the king of the south, right? So that's the Battle of Raffi, right? And we know that um, that's the time of the end in 1798. So the Battle of Raffi parallels 1798 because the king of the south conquers the king of the north. And then we have this interim period to 1989. Now, in Daniel 11, verse 40, it doesn't discuss the interim period, right? It just gives you 1798 and 1989, right? 
But here in Daniel 11, we're, we're looking at a history that's going to parallel that. And this history does have an interim period between two, uh, 217 BC and 200 BC, right? And right. we can look and we can say, well, that, that interim period, what's happening is paralleling what's happening between 1798 and 1989, right? That's what we're, that's what we're suggesting here, right? That what happened historically between the Battle of Raffi and the Battle of Peniel is being symbolized by what had happened with the papacy from 1798 to its conquering of the King of the South in 1989. But it's going to do that through the United States. Now, if we look at the Battle of Raffia, and we say, well, the Battle of Raffia doesn't have the papacy involved with it, right? That is, the king of the north here, which is Syria, it's going to lose to the king of the south, which is Egypt, right? So the king of the south here, in this context, is representing uh um the uh, the king of the south is representing France. So the king of the north is going to lose to France. Right? That is the papacy is going to lose to France. So in this context, in the Battle of Raphia, Rome is isn't involved. We have the king of the north and the king of the south. We have Greece. Right, so that's how we're looking at this. This is a battle, literally between uh, these kingdoms, the division of of the Greek kingdom. Right, right. but when we make a parallel with that, because later Rome becomes the king of the north as a symbol. Right, the symbol of the king of north is going to be transferred to the papacy. So initially here, when we're dealing with the Battle of Raphia, we, we don't have Rome at all being represented, okay? So this is where we have to kind of think this through clearly. We're, we're saying this is parallel in 1798. And, and so we can take the King of the North and the King of the South that happens in Daniel 11, verse 40b, or 40a, pardon me, and we can say, well, that's that's the papacy uh, being taken captive by the king of the south, which is France. Now, then we look at this history, this interim period, but in this history, Rome is going to exalt itself to establish the vision. Right? So Rome is now going to be introduced. And Rome here is, of course, pagan Rome. But it's going to parallel what happens in our history at the time of the end in 1989. Now, it's not going to be until verse 16, which is going to represent what happens in nine, uh, 191 BC, that we see Rome uh, now being the next kingdom, because it's going to do according to his own will. So it, in Daniel eleven sixteen, Rome itself becomes the king of the Right. Okay. Because it, it's it's so there's this transition that happens. So if we're looking at verse 15, now Rome has exalted itself, but it's not the king of the north yet. Right. In verse 15, when it says the king of the north shall come, shall cast up a man and take the most fenced cities. That's not Rome. Right. That's. The king of the north, that's. That's Syria, correct? Right. And and it's going to con conquer the king of the south. But then in verse 16, it says, But he that cometh against him shall do according to his own will. And none shall stand before him, and he shall stand in the glorious land, which by his hand shall be consumed. So, so that is... Uh, Rome comes in after 
after the king of the north defeats the king of the south and Rome becomes the king of the north. Right? Historically. Historically. Right. So what what we would say then in our history, uh, that we just say, well, the king of the north is the papacy. Right? But in this interim period, there the papacy is is not the king of the north. I mean, it is the king of the north, but because it's the king of the north in 1798. The United States becomes the, connected with the papacy, and thus the United States becomes the king of the north. But it's really still the papacy that's conquering the United States. Does that make sense to people? That's a bit or is, of- it that, is it that the United States becomes the king of the north by being connected to the papacy? I think that's a better way of looking at it. Okay. Because the papacy is already the king of the north. So the United States becomes the king of the north in 1989. So it joins hands with the papal power. And, but of course, we know that's at the Sunday law, but it, it's progressive. Correct. So the United States becomes the king of the north. And of course, in our history, then the king of the south is the Soviet Union, right? But then when the Soviet Union falls, um, you know, this is this combination of the United States and the papacy joining hands to take down the Soviet Union. But there is something within the Soviet Union that is this, and we're saying that it's the chosen people, the choicest people. It's nothing to do with the chosen people of God either his choices people or his choices people. Um, neither shall there be any strength to withstand. So we don't know whether this, his chosen people don't withstand. That's sort of the way they do it. But we would have to say that this is referring to the globalists because that's the elite, the globalist elite. And, And so then when it says in verse 16, but he that cometh against him shall do according to his will, historically, that's going to be Rome. Are we going to say that now this is the United States in the present truth application? That's sort of how we seem to have have done it. So, but he that cometh against him. So the United States cometh against the globalists shall do according to his, the United States' own will, and none shall stand before the United States. And the United States shall stand in the glorious land, which by his hand shall be consumed. That, that's he- a paradigm shift. Because I understood it was the papacy coming into the glorious land. If we're saying that the United States is taking the role of the king of the north, then this is the way we would be approaching this verse. Okay, so can you say it again? Sure. Uh, Wait. But he that cometh against him, but the United States that cometh against the globalists, shall do according to the United States' own will, and none shall stand before the United States. And the United States shall stand in the glorious land, which by his hand shall be consumed. Yeah, and that doesn't make any sense. So well, I don't think that's correct, right? Okay, but, so, see, uh, but see, I don't agree with you, but that's how I read that. You just dropped out there. So he that cometh against him. So the one that cometh against him is pagan Rome coming against Seleucid Syria. Agreed. Right. So Seleucid Seleucid Syria 
is the king of the north. Right? But the papacy is going to conquer the king of the north. That is the USA. So does that make sense? So he that cometh against him, he is the papacy, not the United States. But if the United States is the army of the papacy, can't that be interchangeable? No, not, not here, because we're dealing with the historic application making a parallel. And in, in the historical application, pagan Rome is the one that comes against <laughs> Seleucid Syria. Right? So in our history, it's the papacy that comes against the United States. Right? Because there, there's a comment from the chat basically saying U.S. elites agree with papacy to take over the U.S. Now, my next question very quickly, since our time is closing. Yeah. Shall we return to this tomorrow? Yeah, we're going to have to return to this tomorrow. Now, I'm not going to be here the two days after that. I know. So I, will, I will be here tomorrow. Um, so this is something that we really have to hammer out. So we'll see what we can do. I'm not going to have much chance to look at it. I'll see if I can get some time to look at it before tomorrow. But I'm pretty busy here. Okay. Uh, so. Um, hmm. I think I think what we all need to do is is give some consideration to this specific verse for today, so we can each come back with some kind of contribution to address this tomorrow yeah now the interest and the interesting thing here is um we, we, we're, we're looking at this history remember we were deal dealing with 1870 that you're going to have that the vatican or the, the papacy has no more papal states and that's going to be in 1870 right and we had uh taken um because i have a chart here dealing with July 18, 1870. Right. Uh, and that's the lexical sum for Daniel 11, verse 16. If you count from July 18, 1870, and you, you take that number, which is 47,903 inclusive days, that goes from July 18, 1870 to September 11, 2001. Right. So if, if you remember that. Right. So that was the vote for papal infallibility, infallibility. Right. And so that's fitting into what we're saying about this interim period. That there's this connection between the end of the Vatican's papal states to September 11th. In this uh, Daniel 11, verse 16, because it's just. But we've already established that. That, that's what we're looking at. So that's what we have to sort out. Um, so to see what's going to happen in, in, our, in our studies, like obviously tomorrow we'll look at this. And then I'm not here for two days, but I'm sure you guys will do fine. Um, and then on Thursday, I'll be back. Um, so, you know, we're probably going to have to deal with these, uh, some more of this background, I think, over this week to really get this nailed down to see if we can understand it better because I don't think we understand it fully yet. Okay. Right. Okay. Okay. Any other comments at this point? Okay. Shall we then close our study with a word of prayer? Loving Father in heaven, we thank you for this time that we were able to spend together. We thank you for your direction and your guidance. We ask now, Father, for your blessing upon the days that are before us. We ask that you show us that which we should do in order to glorify you and to glorify your name. Be with us now, we ask. We thank you for all that you are doing with us and for us. In Jesus' name, amen.